The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks. This is this is the outline that I'll follow this morning. I want to give you some background on the industry, just a brief overview to provide context, and then somewhat in order of priority, we'll talk about residual carbon injected activated carbon fuel variation, which is becoming a big issue for us. Uh, then we'll talk about finest particle size and reactivity in the ash. And then finally, we'll talk about injected sorbents. Now, everybody in this room probably knows that fly ash is the finely divided residue that results from the combustion of pulverized coal in electrical generating stations. Fly ash is comprised of inorganic residue, or the ash that's left over from that combustion process. Uh, as everyone knows, fly ash is spherical in shape, and that's because it's the, the inorganic fraction has been melted in the combustion process, it's transported into flue gases and assumes a spherical shape. Anything that's too heavy to remain suspended drops to the bottom as fly ash. Okay, a uh, couple interesting things that I would like to point out here. This is based on data from the American Coal Ash Association going back to 1996. This blue line is production of fly ash in tons, and you can see back in 1996, production was around 60 million tons in the U.S. It peaked in 06 at around 72.4 million tons, and then you can see this decline from that time down to currently in 2015, it's about 44.4 million tons is how much fly ash is generated in the U.S. The blue line is the amount of fly ash that's been used in concrete products. You can see back in 1996 that there was about 8 million tons utilized and that's climbed, it's about doubled up to 16 million tons. So while the, the amount of fly ash that's being produced is going down, the amount of fly ash used in concrete has went up. And on the right hand axis you can see that this is the actual utilization of fly ash as, it, as this went from 13% up to about 35%. So. The point here on this slide is that even though fly ash production is going down, utilization is going up. What that means is we're using fly ash that's probably hasn't been used before and that fly ash must be beneficiated to be able to be used in concrete. We were talking about carbon earlier. Carbon is, is our main bugaboo in the industry. Uh, it comes across as residual carbon in a typical coal-fired plant. Why carbon causes problems in concrete is because it absorbs the air and training admixtures that's put into the ready mix concrete. It has an affinity for those types of admixtures. And so, in a real simple way to put it, it, uh, it absorbs those admixtures where they're not available to generate the air in the concrete. Carbon takes on many, many different types, and I'll show you some slides to illustrate that. But in these pictures, I, don't, I hope you can see them well enough. This is a piece of carbon out of one of our sources. You can see it's very glass-like, it's very hard. There's very little surface area associated with this piece of carbon. So it's gonna have little to no effect on air and train admixtures. You can see by comparison, this piece of carbon here has many, many pores in it, very many micro pores in it, so this is gonna have a much higher specific surface area than this carbon here. So even if they represent the same quantity, they're gonna have drastically different influences on how they react in concrete. To point out here, every boiler, and again, like Tom said, every, everything I'm speaking about today is based on personal experience for me. Uh, a lot of the data that I will show you is from the company that I work for. So uh, every boiler that we 
we manage produces carbon of different characteristics. We have sites that have identical boilers, identical megawatts, burning identical coal, constructed at approximately the same time, and these plants will still produce fly ash that has carbon that has different characteristics. And it's a function of the operation of the plant. They're mechanical systems, they wear, uh, they're operated slightly differently. So uh, the point of this slide is that every fly ash source will have different types of carbon in it. Now this <coughs> slide illustrates that here's a series of concrete mixes that were tested in the laboratory and it looks like there were about six of them and again these were our sources that we tested and you have LOI on the horizontal axes, concrete air on the vertical axes and you can see that at equivalent LOI contents, let's say at 2%, at a standard air dose we were only able to get 1% air with this particular fly ash. These series of fly ashes, they still have 2% LOI but you were able to get good air in them. This is typical, you'll see uh, this, this kind of pattern all over. So again, two fly ashes with the same LOIs will have very, very different impacts in a concrete mixture. Now this is an interesting source here on the bottom. There's about five or 600 LOI samples represented on the <laughs> source. And you can see that in all respects, every sample taking was below 2% LOI. But this is a station that if it was not beneficiated, it could not be used in concrete, even though the LOI is always below 2%. We, have, we tried unsuccessfully to market this material into Redimix concrete, and it was so problematic, we just simply could not use it. It had to be beneficiated, so we went in and we did that. Okay, injection of activated carbon. That's something that's come about because of federal environmental regulations. Uh, generators inject powder activated carbon to scrub mercury out of the exhaust gases. And activated carbon is it's a specially manufactured carbon. It has ultra high porosity. Uh, it has a very high surface area because the higher the surface area, the more efficient it is at scrubbing mercury out of flue gases. But because of its porosity, it, al it also has a profound influence on air and training systems in concrete. Again, here's a series of tests. This is a fly ash control here. And you can see that at an air and training dose of about 1%, excuse me, 1 ounce per 100, that the response in the concrete was about 4% air. As you increase it slightly, it goes up to as high as 12%. You add a little bit of activated carbon, three quarters of a percent of activated carbon to that ash, and you can see that the air dose goes from about half an ounce per hundred up to three immediately, and you still haven't gotten into the range of effective air entering concrete. And it, 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 it holds up across the board. You go over and get up as high as two to three percent, and it, it, it's impossible to entrain air in concrete. Now, this data, was uh, generated several years ago, and this was with kind of standard activated carbon before the manufacturers got on board and tried to start manufacturing concrete friendly activated carbons. And they do help and they do work. Uh, it's still difficult to use them without some kind of beneficiation if they're putting activated carbon in the, in, in the flue gas. Now, the, uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to point out here is that it's roughly 10 times more absorptive than regular carbon. We really, remember we were looking at the pictures before, uh, it, it just looks like a sponge. And, and of course they, they manufacture it that way. So it's very, very effective at absorbing admixtures. Okay, I want to talk about coal variability a little bit. But the first thing I want to do is give you a snapshot of coal in the U.S. because this, this is the basis for why fuel variability in our stations are becoming an issue for us. Uh, we know that the input fuel has the greatest single influence on flash quality that we see in our stations. Uh, as Tom was saying earlier, about 33% of the electricity generated in the U.S. is generated from coal. Uh, back in about 1990, it was up over 50%, and now we're down in the, in the 30s. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, one of the chief ones is the price of natural gas 
tends to float in uh, below three dollars a million cubic feet and anytime that happens it, it becomes more economical to generate electricity from natural gas at this coal. Plus you've got the renewables on the scene that are taking up a small percentage. So anyway, coal use is declining, hydro is declining, nuclear has stayed the same, natural gas has really went up. Okay, we're talking about inorganic components of coal. They can range very widely, roughly from 5 to 20 percent. Uh, the lower organ inorganics are going to be in the higher quality coals. The map here on the bottom is a snapshot of where the coal in the U.S. comes from. The big red dot up here in the Powder River Basin produces a Class C ash. It's Powder River Basin, Wyoming coal. It's known by a lot of names, but it's it's the PRB mines up here in this area. Over here are the Appalachian coals and the coals in the mid part of the U.S. So the circles represent volume. So you can see the volumes that are coming out of the Powder River Basin. And I did not. I didn't figure out any tons of percentages here, I should have done that, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how much coal was coming out of that part of the country. Much more economical to mine that coal. Okay, so I spoke about fuel variability. It's driven by a, a lot of different factors in our industry. You know, it, oops. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a matter of economics, what's going on in the energy markets, it's uh, renewable energy, a lot of wind power being put in this country, uh, and environmental regulations have kind of forced or driven these generators into many, many more options with their fuel. They buy imported fuel, they buy spot fuel, they are beginning to burn combinations and blends of Powder River Basin, lignite fuels, and bituminous fuels. This is happening every day, all the time. They're burning combinations of these fuels. So you can imagine, since coal is the greatest single influence on the quality of the ash, what that does. This is just a little example of what one way we manage this. Uh, this is a station that, unfortunately, they'll blend about 25% lignite fuels with 75% PRB. And I say unfortunately because that kind of puts it right on the margin of being a Class C or Class F. So we're trying to market this ash and it will have a tendency to flip back and forth from a C to an F if you can imagine that. You know, we get it approved with the DOT as a Class F, the utility comes in wants to burn some PRB and it flops over to a C. Well, you know, how do you manage that? Well. You'll notice that all these numbers here, they're showing a, the utility is showing a 75-25 blend. But that's not actually what you're getting because these coal, I mean these, these generators, when these plants were built, they didn't put in real sophisticating blending equipment. So you, you honestly have guys out in the coal mine with loaders and dozers and they think, okay, that's about 25%, let's go with that. So. We have to be a little bit more sophisticated around that if we're selling this material. So one of the things that we tried to do here was develop a correlation between the BTUs that the plant is outputting because we know the higher the quality of the fuel, the higher the BTUs. And then we can do, in the laboratory, do XRF and determine the oxides. And so this is a guide that we would use at the plant level to try to make an uh, estimation of, you know, is this a Class C or Class F ass, depending on what the BTUs of the plant are operating. And, you know, realizing that, you know, there is a delay. I mean, total oxides is very difficult to determine unless you have XRF equipment, and, you know, it's a day or two at least, and so you've got silos full of material, and you don't know if it's a Class C or Class F. So, Anyway, the point of this slide is you have to manage that with a program. This is not something that, that is easily addressed, but this is something that's going on. Another issue is managing fineness, particle size distribution, and reactivity. Uh, we know that fly ash performance in concrete is, one of the components is reactivity. And reactivity is con controlled by the crystalline nature of the ash plus the, part of the, the finest or the particle size distribution. And the, the crystalline structure of the ash is a component that we really can't impact, we can't affect, it is what it is. We, but we do know 
Some flashes are more reactive because of the crystalline structure than others. But we can control the particle size distribution to some degree. Now we also know that strength activity index testing out of ASTM C618 is not very effective at predicting the reactivity of flash in the concrete. You have to go into the lab and run concrete with these different flashes to assess the reactivity. Uh, the, there's about three basic ways to uh, modify the particle size distribution. And before I go too far, I would like to point out that you know, in ASTM C618, they have a limit on the 325 SIB, but remember that's only one point on the curve. There's a lot going on above and below that, that 325 SIB. But anyway, you can selectively collect ash, and I'll talk about that in just a second. You can classify the ash, or you can do some grinding on the ash, and I'll, I'll discuss those real quickly here. These, I was looking at this this morning, and it was interesting. These, these three illustrations really didn't have a lot to do with the narrative, so I'll explain them separately and pretend it's two different slides. Uh, again, this is data from, from our plants, uh, and just to show you how average particle size distributions vary by coal type, uh, the first thing to notice is lignites and bituminous are pretty much the same. There's not a heck of a lot of difference between the two. Any given day they'll be about the same, but you'll notice PRB particle size distributions are different. And you'll see this bimodal distribution here, or sometimes even, you know, it's trying to get trimodal. But this is kind of exaggerated. Honestly, I, I'm a little surprised that the peaks were this close together. But uh, just, just to make you aware that coal type itself does have an influence on you know, the particle size distribution of the ash, and it probably gets back to how the plant was originally designed in the collection. If you're going to select, selectively collect ash from a power plant, the first thing that you must do is assess that plants, electro, either electrostatic precipitators or bag houses. I mean, these, these are, in terms of scale, the, these are huge, huge uh, collectors. I mean, it's hard to understand how big they are. I was hoping there was a picture of a man in here, but you know, these are, are gigantic pieces of equipment. But the way they work is a flash comes in one end, and in the ESP, there's, there's wires in these units and they introduce static charge and so this flash sticks to these wires and ultimately drops in the hoppers. And what we try to do in some of our plants is we go in and we selectively collect hoppers to be able to recombine the ash into the particle size distribution that we want. Now it can be difficult to do if equipment is not in place to be able to do that. It just depends on how the plant is designed. But we do do that at a couple of our stations where uh, the ash, as it comes in the back ends of these ESPs, of course the coarses material is going to fall out first and then it gets finer and finer as it goes down. But you need, you know, we have to be aware that the carbon can concentrate as all. So LOI is all what is, is changing as well as the fineness of the material. Now here is, a, a precipitator that we did some sampling on and there's some outliers in here but you can see you know the differences in the particle size distributions by rows. Uh, there's a couple of funny points in here but for the most part you can see that it goes from coarse in the first row to finer in the last row and you're picking up some sub up one micron material in here that's real important for the strength. We classify ash as well uh, there's a lot of different types of classifiers. This is a picture of just a typical silo, uh, cyclone classifier here. Uh, so just an example of what can be done. This particle size distribution curve here is the raw material coming in. Uh, we run it through this classifier, collect it. Anytime you classify a material, you have rejects and then you have your product. You have to decide what you're going to do with your rejects. Generators like you to sell everything that they make. That can be a contractual obligation for us, and so we have to figure out what to do with those rejects. We don't like the landfill, but they have to be addressed. 
they can't be put in concrete, obviously. But you know, we're making a nice product here. Looks good. Wish it had a little bit more of a hump here, but it doesn't. But this is just uh, this is 325 data, and you can see this is what it looks like coming in. And this is what it looks like coming out. So this is a pretty typical installation for marketers. Um, capital, you know, it's it's a five to ten million dollar capital installation, depending on. Uh, what's in place at the plant, if you have to build silos, what kind of transfer equipment you have to put in, those sorts of things. So, but they work very effectively, these classifiers do, but they uh, are very, very good at taking an ash that's a little bit too coarse to meet spec. You know, it works real good at cutting off the coarse fraction. It, they really do not modify the particle size distribution of the ash. They simply reduce the maximum size of it a bit. You can see, you know, you're picking up, you know, a little bit here by making the product, but that's just really a function of this material being gone here. You really don't pick up a lot of reactivity. Pick up some, but you are producing material then that meets the ASTM spec. Injected sorbents is is the last on the list, and uh, it's becoming common as well. There's a lot of different things injected by utilities. Uh, they are not always willing to share a lot of information with you, but uh, we do know that they inject lime, and we know that they inject trona, and we know that they inject sodium bicarbonate. And all these materials that are injected are intended to help scrub uh, socks out of the flue gases for one reason or another. Uh, they're used in combination with SNCRs and SCRs, which are just catalysts. Excuse me, I'm on this. Okay. Ammonia is injected in SCRs and SNCRs uh, to convert you know, the NOx to nitrogen and water. So many plants are putting these in now, and as uh, these catalysts age over time, uh, it introduces, uh, they become less effective, and so there's more ammonia that'll slip through these catalysts, and this ammonia will end up residing in the fly ash. Uh, they did a paper, they did a lot of work, many years ago now at the University of Kentucky and we looked at ammonia and fly ash and the performance and the impact of ammonia on concrete. Uh, ammonia itself is not uh, a hazardous material, it's, it, it's an irritant. You know, it, it is noticed and we do get uh, feedback about it occasionally. Uh, there are technologies on the market today, you may hear about some of those today, that are able to reduce the ammonia in concrete, but I mean in the fly ash. But here's a couple of charts here, and of course the, it kind of makes sense. Here's the, the, you can see that the ammonia concentration in concrete and the concentration in the air, you can see with that the ventilation has a huge impact on how much ammonia is actually liberated from that concrete. And then over here, of course, the poorer the quality of the concrete, in other words, you know, the higher the water cement ratio, the faster the ammonia will come out of concrete out of the concrete. The ammonia itself really doesn't have an impact on the concrete strength. It's more of a nuisance that you must manage. And, and our company has uh, 150 ppm limit on ash generally. It's easy to test for at the plant. And again, it's just something that has to be managed. Thank you, Craig.